In this series, we look at some of the more unknown things in WoW, with today's episode having a heavy focus on Wrath of the Lich King, in celebration of Wrath of the Lich King Classic. First off, let's go over the biggest raid in WoW's history in terms of actual size. World of Warcraft has countless raids, ranging from the smallest single boss raids to the biggest seen across the WoW universe. And while Wrath of the Lich King is well known for its many small raids, like Eye of Eternity, Onyxia's Lair, Vault of Archivon, Obsidian Sanctum, Trial of the Crusader, and the Ruby Sanctum, it is more well known for its largest raids, which is also the largest raid in the game, and seen by a large portion of the community as the best raid in the game's history, Uldwar. Uldwar is a massive titan facility kept guard by the various titan keepers in order to keep track of the planet's corruption and to contain the old god yogg -Saron. And because of this, the raid would have to be huge to compensate for the building-sized denizens towering above you like the ant you are. And while it would be easy to say Uldwar is huge because it needs huge rooms for huge bosses, which to be fair is partially true, there is a few other things that lead to the raid's overall size. Mimron, while the smallest of the titan keepers, smallest of all the bosses in the raid, and possibly the smallest boss in any raid, he is not to be messed with using his giant can opening device he summons various parts of his Voltron in order to fight you, instead of taking you on himself. And while his area is a decent size, it is not the area itself that takes up so much room, but the massive cosmic train you ride to get to his arena. Straight out of Stormwind and Ironforge, this tram covers massive distances very quickly, and unlike those trams, this one actually has you in full control of when it leaves and arrives, no worry of it leaving just before you get on, unless your raid members are very funny people. This tram acts how you're supposed to get to this far remote facility, and while this section is large, it is nothing compared to the other path, that being the Expedition Base Camp, Iron Concourse, and Formation Grounds. This area alone is as big as many multi-boss raids, and yet this entire area is just for one boss, starting off with you gathering your allies into various vehicles and sieging countless iron dwarves, golems, and giants, even taking on various mega-sized mechs, all leading to the eventual fight against the super tank Flame Leviathan, in a massive vehicular base siege on the gates of Ulduar. And while we could go into much more detail about this amazing boss fight, you should go to our Top 10 Fights with Vehicle Mechanics video for more in-depth details on it. The size of Ulduar is amazing to say the least, especially as many of the other large raids are full of dead zones, locations that have nothing to do there, no trash, nothing. For example, here is the full map for the battle for Mount Hyjal. As you can see, the map is huge, and while I'm sure anyone who has done it before know the bottom half cannot be accessed, you would think at least the top half is accessible, usable, and it has some purpose to it being there, maybe some mobs and stuff, and no, not really at all. And while there is the odd mining known here and there, otherwise the rest of the raid is left just empty, with the entire raid really only taking place in a couple key locations. And really, looking back to the Wrath of Lich King raids, it really is a mix box. Naxxramas and Onyxia's Lair, Recycles, Eye of Eternity, Obsidian Sanctum, and Ruby Sanctum, all just one room, Trial the Crusader, just one room, except the last boss, and the Vault of Archivon, one room per patch, all the same, just connected together. Although I guess put in with all these mediocre raids is more than enough worth it for the amazing raids that came alongside them of Old War and Ice Crown Citadel. A pair of raids that if you did not experience while they were current content, you would be doing yourself a disservice not to do it in WoW Classic. Northrend was once intended to be an entirely frozen wasteland, choosing to not give us Snow Zone 1, Snow Zone 2, Snow Zone 3, based on only the very north and south glaciers, they instead chose to also include some great north climate-like regions, like from Canada and Greenland, leading to wonderful landscapes like Boren Tundra, Howling Fjord, and the ever-amazing Grizzly Hills, the number one zone and ambience for most players, except Shulzar Basin, which is just its own thing. But those were just the launch zones. Every expansion has their launch zones and then their eventual post-launch zones, introduced to add new stories and content that could not be done in prior existing areas. The Burning Crusade added the Isle of Kuldanus, the Cataclysm introduced the Molten Front, Pandera the Isle of Giants, Thunder Isles, and the Timeless Isles, Warlords of Draenor added the Tanan Jungle, although that was intended to be at launch, it was added post-launch. Legion added the Broken Isles and the Three Argus Zones. Battle for Azeroth added Mechagon and Ajatar. Shadowlands added Corthia and Xerath Mortis. You may have noticed I missed one expansion there. Yes, Wrath of the Lich King. The one and only expansion to have not added a new zone. An expansion so front-loaded it was able to keep people invested and preoccupied with the world without ever adding a new zone to explore. And even without any post-launch zones, it is still known for its amazing lore and zones. A favorite expansion by many players, especially with the wonderful leveling and questing experience. 
And speaking of leveling experience, with the annoying decision to remove the built-in quest tracker and markers, it has never been a better time to try out our video sponsor, Reset XP. A simple to use and efficient leveling route, extremely fast routes made to custom fit your class, no worry the guy telling you're rogue to do quests only possible for those cheesy pet classes. Perfectly crafted routes for all Northrend 68 to 80, be you making your way through your 8 alt, speedrunning for fun, rushing to be server first max level, or trying WoW Classic for the first time. They even have guides for fresh level 1s as well. Reset XP and their amazing guide writers will make sure you get there as soon and as painlessly as possible. Written and sourced from the most dedicated speedrunners. Classic not your style? Well, Rest XP has upcoming routes for retail too, including a planned Dragonflight route. So keep your feet to the frozen waste and your eyes to the soaring skies, and go check out RestedXP.com. Wine is well known around the globe, a fermented alcoholic drink made usually of grapes that is aged for years, sometimes decades, getting better and better with the years. And at least for Christy Stockton of One More Glass within Dalaran, a city of snobby mages, the perfect place for wine snobs. Christie sells Dollaran Red, both in bottle and cast form, each with a flavor text of Improves with Age, and a duration of 365 days. These white quality drinks will actually age in your inventory, and after having purchased either the bottle or cask of Dollaran Red, and waiting an entire real year, you receive a bottle or cask of aged Dollaran Red, now green quality. And while these items are also available on the vendor, aging them yourselves, you save five times the gold. So if you really wish to get some aged dollar and red and are fine waiting a year, you can save a lot of gold. However, this is not all. While the vendor only sells these two versions of the drinks, you will notice the green quality versions still have a duration and flavor text. So holding on to them yet again for another year will yield you another bottle or cask of peaked dollar and red, a blue quality item that finally has its duration removed and the flavor text aged to perfection. And while these items have literally no actual use, they do at least let you enjoy a nice drink, either alone or with up to 24 other raid members. So, if you're entering the frozen north and wish to have a cask of perfect wine, you may wish to buy it as soon as you have the gold. That way, the day you kill the Lich King, you have the perfect drink to celebrate with your fellow raid members. Something extremely special, proof of time. Although the fact there's no purple and then orange quality wine that ended up taking 3 to 4 years is kind of sad, really. Legendary Y is something we desperately need these days. Wrath of the Lich King had many cut features, the most well-known being the infamous Dance Studio, something that has become a joke in the community and even Blizzard themselves with a garrison mission referencing it. But there was many other things cut from the expansion, two of which we feel the most notable are the rune crafting system and aerial PvP combat. Wrath of the Lich King made vehicles much more of an actual mechanic on its own, with many raid fights, dungeon fights, and quests utilizing the vehicle system, so it's obvious to see why they would want to make a PvP use of it too, and while they did with the Isle of Conquest and Wintergrass for ground-based vehicles, they also planned to do so with air-based vehicles. However, for one reason or another, it was cut, seemingly pretty late into development too, as it actually made it onto the Wrath of the Lich King box art. The only time the expansion box has shown a right out lie advertising something that is not in the game, even to this very day. Although there is some argument for the Demon Hunter and the Vanilla Wall box art, that was more so just a character and not an advertised feature though. Now onto something much less known, the Death Knight rune crafting system. Originally announced at BlizzCon, the Death Knight would actually be able to customize the runes on their weapon, and not in the way you may think. As of launch, Death Knights got their own class specific enchants to add to their weapons and rune forges. However, originally it was planned to work far differently. The original Death Knight runeforging system had you, upon collecting a new weapon, go to a runeforge to transform it into a rune blade, allowing you to carve runes into it and then outside of combat be able to enchant runes into the blade. Like live, you would be given 6 rune slots with the blood, unholy, frost, and death runes. However, unlike the Death Knight we got, you would actually be able to choose whatever runes you wish to inscribe and add special enchantments to them to make them recharge faster, empower the spells consuming them, or transform into death runes, even increasing with use much like the original rogue's lockpicking skill, allowing for more and more powerful runes, meaning if you wish, you could have 6 blood runes. However, with Blizzard's goal to try and de-incentivize people choosing all of one type, they seemingly just could not make it work, and locked it to 2 of each type, putting the special effects onto the rune forging system as special weapon enchants, which overall is a good thing. While it sounds interesting, in practice it feels like it would be an absolute nightmare. Although, what would be a better fit for the relentless undead juggernauts that was the most broken class at its launch, the Death Knight? Speaking of the hero class Death Knights, they were called hero classes for a reason. 
a callback to the MMOs of old, a good example being the Jedi in Star Wars Galaxy, the original Star Wars MMO. This Jedi class was obscenely difficult and time consuming to obtain. Having the class originally proved you went through an insane amount of time, effort, and resources, and as a reward you gained this extremely powerful class, which easily outperformed all the other classes, making you a god amongst peasants. While this worked in its time period, it's easy to see the major flaws in this. Although at the time, that was the Wrath of the Lich King's development, they decided they wanted to do this for the Death Knights as well. Originally planned, you would need to wait until Wrath of the Lich King's launch and level from 70 to 80. Upon doing so, you would then betray humanity itself and pledge allegiance to the Lich King himself. In order to do so, you'd be given a long and difficult questline in order to earn his trust. In doing so, you would then unlock the Death Knight hero class. And a hero class it was. As with the launch of the expansion, the Death Knight was so overpowered they could quite easily outperform an entire party with their huge defensive, damage, and self-healing capabilities. And while Blizzard quickly realized their mistake, as making a Death Knight only require this hilariously easy task of reaching level 55, and making a class that was better than the rest of them in every way, it took them quite a while to bring the class in line with all the others, nerfing them again and again before finally getting them somewhat in line with the rest of the classes. The idea of a class being overpowered as a reward for completing a difficult and time-consuming task may have worked out one time, these days, with how modern games don't like to waste your time as much as they used to, and with the internet being so easy to access, search, and compile compared to the old days of random message board rumors, it's hard to keep anything truly a secret when it's just going to be made into a step-by-step -step guide two months before release. Lastly, with the mindset growing within the community around any and every power benefit, it no longer became something you made the choice to work towards, but something that was now required, and so it had to be changed or else everyone who was not a healer would be forced to unlock and play Death Knight. In the beginning days of WoW, there was not a specific role for each spec. Examples being the Feral Druid, which while sharing the same tree could be a tank or a DPS, meaning a druid saying they were Feral would not tell you what they actually were. Same for Paladins, as for a lot of early WoW, most of their time in tank spec was actually with mostly holy talents. Death Knights were the final experience of this, however, as with the very next expansion Cataclysm, they redid talents, forcing you to choose a tree to specialize into, with each of them having an assigned role, requiring you to then fill these trees to a specific point before then being able to put points into any of the other trees. So what made the Death Knight so special then? Well, the fact all three of their specs could be DPS, which is pretty common for the DPS only classes like Rogue, Hunter, Mage, and Warlock. However, these three specs could also all tank, each spec having their own style of tanking and DPS. Frost focused on using the frigid winds of Northrend to slow the attack speeds of your enemies, while increasing your own, bolstering your armor with ice while slowing your enemies as well, making kiting easy, even more so with dual wielding blades and ranged casts. Blood focused on dodging and parrying attacks, and while failing to do so meant taking heavy damage, you made your health pool a resource, sacrificing health to gain resources, while also countless abilities to feed your own health pool, sacrificing your own blood to steal the blood of your opponent's lives, literally using your defense as a weapon, swarming blood worms to leach your opponents dry and refill your own. And lastly Unholy, which focused on plaguing your enemies with sickness and disease, summoning undead ghouls and gargoyles to decimate your enemies, enhancing your allies with forsaken magics, defying magic itself with barriers of anti-magic, and shields of enraged plague and bone. With each spec having its own style for not only DPS but also tanking, this meant each spec had its own niche of boss fights it was best suited for. Unholy for its anti-magic capabilities dealt with tanking mage-based boss fights that dealt lots of magic damage, Frost was great at dealing with physical bosses, who usually cleave through the average tank's armor, now glanced from their tainted armor, sedated by the swirling colds, and Blood with its ability to sustain itself when healers had issues, able to act well as an off-tank tanking constant low damage, sometimes able to go entire fights without needing any focused healing at all, allowing for more healing to go elsewhere, although suffering if Blood too deep. And while they all had their use as DPS as well with Frost's rapid attacks and ranged attacks and Unholy's undead and decay, Blood was the weakest of the three for DPS. Having a few good times here and there, it acted more as the best solo content spec, especially for leveling. And to end off the video on a quick fact, something few remember, but the actual Cataclysm expansion was announced at BlizzCon 2009, three and a half months before the release of Ice Crown Citadel, and then another four months until the Wrath of the Lich King's death. A major part of that being the obscenely long time getting of Ice Crown Citadel, taking three whole months from the raid's launch, for the heroic version of the raid to open. This caused quite some oddities at said BlizzCon, an example being many people asking about not the upcoming expansion, but the upcoming raid against Blizzard's most famous villain. No, not Illidan Stormrage, he's not a villain, he's an anti-hero. The Lich King. 
A good example of this being that during the Cataclysm itemization panel, while speaking about changing how stats worked and what stats appeared on what gear, for example removing mana per 5, replacing it with spirit, decided to randomly announce Shadowmourne, again in the middle of a Cataclysm itemization panel. Something that is just obscenely odd to me really. They didn't even speak about its stats or anything to have it match with the panel, they just sort of announced a new legendary out of nowhere, showing just its name and appearance. Although they did later make an official preview showing the special effect it had, while explaining a general idea of the process of obtaining it through going to the raid to gather resources in order to craft it. They weirdly again did not share its stats, so just kind of odd. Alright, and that's it for the unknown side of Northrend. Make sure to check out the playlist on the other videos if you want more, and of course, thanks so much to Rested XP for sponsoring us today. Cannot recommend them enough.